Hey, Mike, what do Kelly Slater and PT have in common? I don't know. They're both world champs? Nope. They both own Endless Summer Box Set. Oh, my God. Rad. You guys, you can get it, too. The link's in the show notes. Welcome back, everybody, to the QuiverCast. This is Mike, your host. And this is all brought to you by YourAudioLegacy.com and QuiverBuilder.com. And please check out my other podcast, The Stinky Booties, I do with my buddy, Billy. Let's roll! Hello, everybody. This is Mike here at the QuiverCast, and we have a very, very special guest. One of the most probably famous servers of the 80s, for sure East Coast servers, Mr. Wes Lane, senior, senior. How you doing, Wes? Doing good, Mike. How's it going today? Good, good. I'm pretty stoked. Get to talk to you and your son. It's pretty rad. Yeah, we're stoked to be here. Great to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. So, my earliest memory is like like when I started surfing, and I don't know how old you are, but you're probably just a few years older than me. Seeing you in the magazine, so like, and you were the the East Coast guy, really. Well, I was always proud to be an East Coast surfer, but you know, for me. I think just getting respect. Um, I love to travel. I love to get good waves, but uh, for me, it was always a mission to to get respect and earn a little respect in the lineup. So, you know, that was a motivating factor. Always was, and you know, honestly, it still is. Is it okay? Let's start off in the beginnings. What got you into surfing? How did you get? Sur- would you always grow up in Virginia Beach? So, yeah, I I grew up in Virginia Beach and started surfing here in Virginia Beach. Uh, My older brother, Randy, Mm -hmm. who uh, was also a competitive surfer, did the IPS tour back in 1977 when, you know, the early days of professional surfing were just kind of taking root. But uh, I started surfing at a very young age, you know, with my brother and really my dad, who one person would push me in, the other person would catch me in the shore break. Um, I started here in Virginia Beach and, you know, obviously surfed a lot of East Coast waves. And when my brother graduated from high school, he moved to Carlsbad, California and went to college out there. So that gave me the perfect opportunity to start flying out to California, you know, a couple times a year and, you know, trying to hit as many surf spots on the West Coast as possible. Okay. So did your dad surf too? No, my dad was really, uh, he did surf, but he was mainly a, a sail. He, he liked to sail. Okay. So uh, Hobie cats, sunfish, sailfish, and then, uh, you know, windsurfers, sailboards. That was kind of his deal. Wow. Uh, s- surfing was kind of Randy and myself. That was our, that was our thing. Okay. So, so really Randy paved the way for you to, to, to be a surfer. Yeah, absolutely. I, I looked up to, you know, everything that, he did and all the guys he surfed with. So, uh, he's nine years older than me. So Mm -hmm. I, you know, wanted to do exactly what he did followed right in his footsteps. Right on. Okay. So, um, how was Virginia beach back then? Probably less crowded than it is today. A lot less crowded. I think, uh, you know, back in the early days, you knew everyone that surfed, you knew everybody that had a board. It seemed like, for those very, very early years here in Virginia Beach, a lot of guys would plan their day on going out wherever everyone else was going out. So they would kind of call around and, hey, this would be the spot, and that'd be where everybody went. Obviously, as the years went on, that changed completely. And uh, you know now it's very crowded at most of the spots, and you're trying to avoid other people. Back then, you were calling mm-hmm. everybody to see where the spot was, where they were going out. Yeah. Yeah. And then when did the contest thing start for you? Your brother was already competing, I guess. Is it yeah. Led your way? Randy was already surfing in contests. I think he won uh, ECSC junior men's in 1968. Uh, and then, you know, I, I started that same year. I think I got last in my first heat, but uh, I enjoyed surfing contests. Uh, ECSC was wow. the first event for me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, this absolutely followed in his footsteps. Right on. So then with your brother living out here, 
that kind of opened the door to see new breaks? Is that what? Yeah, I think uh, that was a real eye opener. The first year I went to California, um, got to actually surf a point break, you know, a reef break, which I'd never, never had the opportunity to do before. Mm-hmm. Got to, you know, surf with guys like Joey Baran, David Barr, a lot of the West Coast, you know, the top West Coast guys who were also my age, also Carlsbad surfers. So at the time, there were a lot of really, really good surfers coming out of uh, San Diego County and especially Carlsbad. So I was fortunate, hung out with those guys and spent as much time as I could, you know, in the Carlsbad area. Okay. You like San Diego? Love it. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of good, lot of good waves, a lot of good waves. <laughs> it has its days for sure. Yeah, right on. Um, and that was, you know, that was kind of cool because you know my brother uh, had started shaping for Canyon Surfboards in San Diego. Oh, really? And at the time, uh, Rusty Priesendorfer, which had his own label, had not yet gotten over to Canyon Surfboards, but uh, soon came over to Canyon, and I started riding shapes from Rusty. You know, back in those late seventies, early eighties, rusty, great surfer also happens to be a a taller, bigger guy. And he just really understood how to shape a a really good board for a bigger person. Wow. Yeah. I didn't think about that. Yeah. How tall are you? I'm six, four. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can always tell you're tall, but, um, and how how did that work? It had to be a disadvantage being taller and surfing and growing up from Virginia beach, even surfing California, really. Yeah, absolutely. It's a disadvantage, you know, in small waves. But funny thing is, when you when you're forced to surf a lot of crummy small waves, you get good at it, no matter what your size is. If that's what you get, that's most of what you get and all you get. Uh, you you learn to adapt and, and and get better. You know, it might take some time, but it, you you have to. Uh, but uh, Rusty, such a good shaper. Uh, understood how my brother surfed, you know, definitely understood how I surfed and, you know, for sure him being a taller surfer himself could relate that into his shapes. Yes. Yeah. For, uh, for sure. So then you're kind of getting older. When do you make the jump into, when did you decide you wanted to be a professional surfer? Or did they ever have that discussion in your head? No, you know, it never was a really a thought or discussion. I just, uh, I, competing at an amateur level. Um, I thought that was really all of where contests were going for me personally. I started surfing professionally in 1979. There was an East Coast tour, you know, on the East Coast, uh, the APS tour. And then I would fly out to California in January and surf the Caton event in Huntington Beach. Yep. And, you know, those, those little uh, or big events, you know, they ended up being a big event for me was what got me to fly to Australia to start the first leg of the pro tour, which at the time was the IPS tour Mm -hmm. in 1979. So I got lucky just kind of happenstance January, 1979, I finished fifth in the Caton in California. Wow. Uh, Tommy Curran, who was an amateur had to decline the prize money. So the prize money bumped down one spot for all of us. So (laughs) all of us got more money. It enabled me to uh, hook up with rip curl wetsuits and, and, you know, fly to Australia for the first leg of the the world tour, which that year there were five events in Australia. Um, Fortunately for me, I did well enough to make it to the next leg of the tour, which was South Africa. So just total luck that that I was able to, you know, put enough together to make that first part of the tour. Um, so a lot of good times. Yeah. So was competition like, was it heavy or were you guys fr- like, were you like really competitive and like wanted to win or was it you just having a good time and organically you just happened to be a good I, I think, I think I enjoyed contests, uh, mm-hmm. especially, uh, at, at the younger level. And, you know, the, the cool thing about the era, which I came up with it, it uh, I got to surf against and with, you know, the era I looked up to the most, the Mark Richards, Wayne Bartholomew, Sean Thompson, Dan Kailoa, Michael Ho, you know, all of those guys were the ones that were 
holding down the top spots on tour and and also you know the the best surfers they were also the best surfers in hawaii so to me that was amazing getting a chance to travel and surf and compete with those guys and then obviously making the transition through the 80s with tommy curran tom carroll gary elkerton uh you know the dave mccauley's and barton lynch damien hardman so it was really cool to get to be in that two different era scenario where you get you know the the guys from the 70s and and you get the, the guys from the 80s and then then the, the 90s hit and you get a whole nother generation moving in but the 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 guys who began the world tour during the ips years you know that was really some special special times and some amazing rivalries that you just don't see now on the WSL tour. Uh, you know, the Dane Kealoa versus Joey Baran, uh, the Wayne Rabbit Bartholomew, Dane Kealoa, uh, the Mark Richards, Shane Haran. You know, those were just life and death rivalries that you don't see anymore. And that's, uh, I was glad to, you know, be right there checking it out and being a part of it. Couple questions. Do you think that'll ever come back? How competitive Man, surfing, pro surfing is today? That's a good question. You know, that's really the thing that I think that the tour misses the most is the intensity and the rivalries. Um, even going up so much as uh, the more recent one that the Andy Irons, Kelly Slater, yeah. you know, those are are gone. You know, it's 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 going to be a challenge to get that back again and i think that's what competitive surfing really needs right now is that really intense rivalry between you know the great champions that that you know it's life and death it's doesn't seem to be as urgent as it was back in those days partially due to the fact that if you weren't winning and and doing well you're you're going to end up staying home so <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays they get paid a lot more. They can afford to travel whether they win or lose. Uh, but you know, it, it's a different different scenario. Not sure if they could ever regain that that you know competitive rivalries that you saw so prevalent, you know, throughout the seventies, eighties, and nineties. Do you think the rivalries you 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 stated? Were they true rivalries? Did these guys not like each other walking down the street, or were they friendly after the heat? No, they were real. They were they were <laughs> Good. they yeah, were real. Right. Right. Um, and it 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 permeated the whole tour. It, it mm -hmm. really uh, began to divide camps between okay. the Hawaiians uh, versus the Australians, um, and you know the the guys from the U.S. Uh, against you know, East Coast, West Coast, uh, Hawaii versus the mainland, uh, the South Africans. So it, it it really was a more intense scenario in terms of uh, the rivalry. What was your take on it? What was your feelings? I, I loved it. I thought that was one of the most attractive part of professional surfing was the fact that it was it was pretty much a, a war it was you know you were going into battle uh fortunately for us during those years there were you know 20 some events sometimes 28 events on the world tour so if you if you didn't do well one week you know you you could had a chance to come back and redeem yourself a week or two later but um you know it was it was super fun and i i enjoyed the intensity um the first few years on tour there was no priority buoy. There was no priority mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. So you had to paddle and fight and hassle to get waves. And if you didn't get the waves, you weren't going to get through the heat. Right. So there was that added element to competitive surfing that you don't see now. Now you've got uh, an allocated uh, priority system, which definitely enhances the performance side, but it, it removes a lot of the, the, you know, the tactical strategy and the psychological warfare and the physical, the physical battles that you, you would see in competitive surfing during those eras. Do you like the buoy now or not the buoy? Do you like priority now or do you not like it? Yeah, I do. And it's really the only way that you can 
I mean, I think for now, it's, that's all you can do uh, until surfing takes a, a, another angle and, and a, a, a newer approach. That's what you have to do. But, you know, competitive surfing will always change. There'll always be some changes, some tweaks. But one of these days, uh, you're going to see, I think, some major changes in the way that uh, professional surfing is portrayed and, and the formats that you see competitively. I think there'll mean? be some changes. Do you have any ideas what those are? Are there any thoughts of what you would do? I've got a lot of thoughts of what I would do, but I think it's it's going to take you know a, a different uh, group of people to mm-hmm. usher in you know a newer format. Um, but it'll happen. It'll happen in time, and all sports go through the period of metamorphosis. Some go through radical change in a short period of time. Some it takes a long time to evolve and to refine. And I think we're we're in that process now, of slow refinement, but. Who knows what's to happen down the road? So the IPS was the ASP, which is now the WSL, right? Um, yep. Do you think that organization is going to end, or are they going to just piggyback off the next organization or format or whatever you're saying? Hard, hard to say. I don't. I don't think it's going to end. I think uh, there's there's too many good things happening mm-hmm. for it just to end. Um, but I do think that there's uh, there's there's change in the wind. Really interesting. Okay, going back to your first heat, how how were you doing better in those bigger waves or smaller waves, like in the beginning of your career as a pro? Well, surfer? but beginning of my career, I did better in small surf. Okay, uh, that was kind of what got my foot in the door. Okay, um, was definitely competing in smaller waves because the tour on the early days, you know, having a lot of events, a large number of events in the year. A lot of those contests got held in fairly marginal surf, which is mm-hmm. kind of right up my alley. Coming from Virginia Beach, <laughs> I was comfortable in that. Yeah. Uh, sure. So when the OP Pro at Huntington Beach came around, you know, that was fine by me, no matter if it was, you know, one to two or two to three or six to eight. But yeah. uh, Huntington Beach is a lot like uh, our pier here in Virginia Beach. So I was totally comfortable. Okay. Um, but yeah, at the time, I mean, Um, the tour could get marginal surf, could get great surf. It's a lot of the stops on the tour were the same as where they are now, but, uh, just the sheer number of events on tour, you are likely to get some average to marginal surf conditions for quite a few events. So the events were aimed towards attendance, people showing up on the beach to watch back then. Yeah. Yeah. Physical. Yeah, the people. you're absolutely right. Yeah, physical attendance was really the only way to see the event. You know, the OP Pro, which was right. the precursor for the U.S. Open, yep. was one of the largest attended events ever seen in, in professional surfing. The Stubbies at uh, Burley Heads on the Gold Coast, that was one of the, mm-hmm. again, the largest attended events uh, that the, surf, the sport of surfing has ever seen. Um, so there were a handful of those, the Gunston 500 in Durban, South Africa, again, heavily attended, but that was really the nature of the beast at the time. Surf contests, you couldn't go online and watch them. You couldn't watch them live. You had to either, you know, hear about it, read about it in the magazine, or you had to physically go there to watch the event. Right. So you, you didn't even know who was going to be world champ until a month after it happened or two months yeah, if you were following, you, you didn't know who the champ was unless your phone rang right. or you got an early copy of Surfer or Surfing Magazine. Yeah, <laughs> it's so trippy. Do you like how technology has changed it or do you think it could go backwards a little bit? Well, that part of it I love. I, I, I love the fact that, that you can be up to speed mm-hmm. on exactly what's going on uh, and just, by, just by turning on your phone. Yeah. Um, that, that's great because it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a positive thing in terms of, you know, how the competitive scene is structured, the formats, uh, you know, that type of thing. Sure. There's, there's going to be changes. I think, uh, uh, it's obvious there'll be changes. I think, you know, just look at the big wave tour right now, which is an obvious, uh, missing link. You've got, uh, the best, most talented, physically, mentally 
the most talented big wave riders on earth right now are doing the most amazing, incredible things. And you're really not, they're not getting their due. They're not, no. you know, they don't have a tour. They don't really have a, a, a tour like they did a few years ago. So they're not able to really show uh, their level of, of their ability and their skill because right now there's really no big wave tour. Do you think that's the the organization not pushing it like they should? Or do you just think, like, I wonder what, yeah, because you don't I, hear about it. I think really. they've got a lot on their plate between too much play on um, their plate. Pro, between pro junior, yep. uh, longboard, um, big wave tour, women's. You know, you've got a lot of moving mm-hmm. parts and a lot of things that are all incredibly valuable. Uh, question is, how do you balance it? How do you give each of those components the 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 time and the, the you know the the dedicated space that it mm. needs? So, and you know, money. to me, the, the, the big wave tour and the big wave surfers, uh, I think, are, you know, some of the biggest potential draw on mm. earth in the sport yeah. of surfing. And they yeah. just kind of right now it's it's a missing kind of a missing link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, you surf trials. Do you think was that a, what, did you like? Do you think that would help surfing today if they started the trials again? Absolutely. I love the trials because. Uh, you know, can you do it in today's uh, scenario where you've got the high number of competitors? Maybe not. It's a it's a tough one. But the the early days of IPS ASP, where you had a local trials where all the best surfers from Pipeline were in the main event, all the best surfers on the Gold Coast uh, qualified, and they were in the main event. So you got the benefit of having all of the top or many of the top local surfers at that particular break were in the main event of the contest. So each contest on tour had a distinctly different flavor, depending on what break yeah. you were at. Sunset Beach, Pipeline, Gold Coast, Durban, Jeffreys Bay. So that's, uh, that's another part that's missing. How do you get that back? You know, don't have the answer for that. But there was huge benefit from having local trials where 16 of the top local surfers at that particular break qualified to make the main event. If you did a QS, the how they have it now, and then you went to the CT and you were surfing G-Land like a couple weeks ago, would would that have mixed everything up? Would there have been different surfers in different places ranked-wise? Does that, does well, that obviously, depending on the break, depending on what spot you're at, you know, there's gonna that's going to determine – how many local trialists you allow into the main event. Okay. For example, a place like Pipeline, you've got dozens of guys that yep. live there that could win the event and, and should mm-hmm. be in the event. And to me, they, they are the pipe masters. Uh, same thing at Sunset Beach. Sunset Beach has a, a, a very tight crew of some of the best surfers on earth that you just don't get a chance to see you know, in the main event because they can't qualify. But depending on the the spot, uh, depending on the local spot and and how many numbers of elite level surfers hold down that area, you know, that's really, that's, that's the X factor. That's, that's what the the toughest part of, you know, how do you create a format that, that allows for the best talent from each of those local spots to find their way through into the contest, into the main event. Yeah. And then you were, so as you worked your way up in the IPS and the ASP, you were seated, right? You made the seating. So yeah, once, once you made the 16, you were seated in every main event. Right. And uh, then of course they would take the top 16 trialists uh, and, and a few, a handful of wild cards and, and uh, you know, go from there. Okay. But now surf pro surfing, they're getting good waves. Did you get waves like, you didn't get the spots like they did. Yeah, we, we really did. We, oh, we did? started the tour in, in the Gold Coast at Burley Heads. Okay, yeah, uh, that's good. There man. were events at Sydney. Uh, the second stop on the tour was, was South Africa, which there was an event at Jeffreys Bay. Yep. Sometimes Cape Town. That's true. Sometimes two in Durban. Um, but a lot of the spots were the same. Uh, Bali, Uluwatu, obviously North Shore, um, Japan, Brazil, and 
okay. uh, California. So yeah. you got a, really a lot of the same locations, but you got the benefit of, you know, more numbers, more sheer numbers of events, uh, which, you know, obviously you got some good surf and some marginal surf with yeah. just the fact that you have to surf more events in a year. Yes. Yes. Was that draining? It was, but it, it's fun. It? You know, it's fun. And the thing is, I think, you know, what I discovered probably later on tour in later years is that, you know, the longer you can travel as a, a, a competing professional surfer, the more good waves you get around the world. And a lot yeah. of times the event might be held in marginal conditions uh, at Margaret River and then a week later. Uh, West Australia is is firing. So mm. you happen to be there. You, you didn't score that well in the contest, but the next week the surf was incredible. So just yeah. the fact that you know you're there, you're traveling, you're in some of the best locations in the world. Uh, sooner or later, you're going to score, and a lot of times it was sooner than later. Did you have any rivals? Um, some guy that you needed to beat, like like you know. Wow. That's a good question. I mean, to me, everyone was on an equal basis in terms of being a rival. I mean, to me, beating the other person, regardless of who it was, it, it was it was life and death. I mean, I wanted to win. Uh, and a lot of the time I knew that the, the guy that I was up against was better than I was, you know, a mm. Tom Curran, a Tom Carroll. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for me, it was a mission uh, to win. And, you know, I really wasn't any specific uh, rivals. They all seemed the same to me. If they put a jersey on against you, you wanted to beat them, basically. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. The different question. What group did you hang out? You said they started segre segregating each other's group. Who were you hanging out with? So I, I hung out with, uh, uh, traveled a lot with Willie Morris, uh, Jamie Brissick. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mitch Thorson, Dave McCauley. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I also traveled with Hans Hiedemann, um, Sean Thompson. So, you know, there were times that I traveled with, you know, a, a number of guys that, uh, you know, weren't USA mainland or, you know, definitely weren't East Coast, but they were not, uh, you know, U USA mainland. <laughs> and then that's a good question, too. East Coast guys, how many... Was there anybody traveling with you before Kelly even showed up? Or there's a few guys, right? So yeah, there were um, Matt Keckley, Charlie Kuhn, oh yeah, Matt Rich Keckley. Rudolph, um, Scott McCrannels. All those guys did a number oh, of yeah, world tour events. But you know, the guys I looked up to were really the generation <laughs> before them: the the the, the Jeff Crawford, uh, Greg Lore, Rick Rasmussen. Um, you know, people forget that. Jeff Crawford won a pipe masters. Yeah. Uh, yeah he's they a they forget that he was on the IPS tour. You know, he surfed in the Duke contest. He surfed in, you know, all the sunset beach pipeline. He traveled the tour. So, you know, I looked up to those guys cause they were kind of the ones that blazed the trail, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and they were the inspirational, you know, it was inspirational to me that, uh, you know, guys out of the East coast, guys from Florida, guys from the Gulf Coast, guys from New York, Long Island could could make it, uh, you know, and do well at Pipeline and do well at Jeffrey's Bay um, and Sunset Beach. So if you walk in, let's, let's say 1980, if you walked into a restaurant in Huntington, like close to the pier, someone would probably recognize you. Were you getting the same treatment in Virginia Beach at the same period? Did people know who you were that you yeah, were representing I, I East think, Coast? I think uh, for... East Coast and for Virginia Beach standards, you know, yeah, I was absolutely well known. More, more so over here than, you know, even in Huntington Beach. But yeah, the East Coast and especially Virginia Beach, small community at the time, small surfing community, um, and everybody, you know, everybody follows. Uh, at the time, everybody was really following the World Tour uh, because it was somewhat new. I think uh, mm -hmm. when ASP came in and, and took over from IPS, uh, brought in a lot of new ideas. Uh, obviously, the sponsorship dollars greatly increased. So there was a lot of interest and a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, 
excitement around competitive surfing, you know, in that generation of the eighties. Do you think that, um, you're traveling that did that improve? Obviously improved your big wave surfing. Where was your favorite big wave surf spot? You being a bigger guy. Wow. Early on, you know, it would have to be sunset beach because, okay. you know, the, the earliest years sunset beach was the proving ground. Um, mm-hmm. the it pro was. class trials at sunset beach, uh, the, the Cuervo, the world cup, um, you know, sunset and pipeline were number one and number one or number one and number two. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had to do well at sunset. You had to do well at pipeline. Um, and if you didn't, you would just kind of vanish, uh, from, from the, 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 the <laughs> landscape. <laughs> Well, tell us about uh, a wave at, at sunset. One of your better waves. Do you remember? Like, there's there one in your memory wow. bank. Or it's, I, I'm like, not sure there's there's any one, but okay, I can I can definitely remember the worst beatings at right, sunset. Yeah. Uh, and and here's one in particular. <laughs> um, this was probably 1984. Okay. Um, as big as sunset gets, sunny, mm-hmm. straight offshore wind, and just verging on just not being manageable at all it was huge and it had a lot of west in it and i remember the morning i mean like it was yesterday everyone's out uh paddle out and first thing get hit by a giant west set and the lip broke four feet in front of my face and i got blasted and launched out of the water hit by three maybe four more waves and when i came up to the surface in the foam ken bradshaw was six inches from my face and he looks at me with this big smile on his face and he's like hey wes good morning (laughs) screams it in my face and i'm just completely annihilated but he'd gotten the same ones on the head that i got yeah he just thought it was the funniest thing on earth and that was the best way to start your day Wow. Okay. What What was your thoughts there? Were you Were you Were you cool with it, or were you like fearing for your life? Like, what, no, what I was wasn't. Your head? I wasn't cool with it at all because it pretty much, <laughs> you know, it ruins your morning. But <laughs> by the time you get to the channel and you 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 know you catch your breath, you compose yourself, you figure, okay, I just probably took the worst beating I could possibly take, and and the guy next to me is Ken Bradshaw. He's laughing about it. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's got to be okay. It's got to be, you know, it's a rite of passage, but it's also something that you're probably better off that it happened uh, mm-hmm. just to get through it and put it under your belt. What about pipe? Have you had a wipe out of that pipe comparable to that? Um, worse, better? W- worse, because I think at pipeline, you know, you're always hitting the bottom. Yeah. I mean, that's Shallow. a reality at backdoor. And, and at pipeline, I was never – really a pipe guy i mean i loved pipeline but i was not part of the pipeline crew you know Mm -hmm. my best finishes were semifinals. i was always a backdoor off the wall kind of person but regardless of whether you go left or right at pipeline yeah you're hitting the bottom i mean that's just you have to accept the fact that you're gonna you're gonna make contact uh if you want to surf the place you're going to, you're going to hit, you're going to land on something. Um, the bad thing is, is all of the different ways that you can get hurt there. Uh, and you know, nowadays the, the crowd is, you know, even the most intense factor is the, the crowd, but the bottom there is, you know, one of the most dangerous places on earth, obviously the, the place you got to respect the most, but you have to just understand that you're going to take beatings and the beatings, you know, r- result in, you know, body contact on the bottom. Wow. Do you, uh, now back when you started going to Hawaii, Hawaii was known as more of a like kind of wild west. Like it was regulated by the Hawaiian guys. Definitely different world then than it is now. Uh, yeah. and, and I respect that. I mean, I thought that, um, that was kind of a good thing because, you know, there was an understanding that, if you got out of line, you were, you were going to hear about it. You were going to get tuned immediately. Uh, 
nowadays it's it's a different world you can still you can still uh get tuned up but it's it's much more of a family atmosphere uh i don't i, I would say yeah it's more crowded uh but really the, the traffic is the biggest headache and certainly Just the crowd there. the crowds are too but but yeah i that's another thing i'm really stoked that i got to travel to hawaii and get there and and understand and see you know the earlier days the pecking order uh the level of respect that you had to have uh just to paddle out and and that was you know that was a cool thing to me that was good so when you went there um I mean, were you ever called into a wave where you had no intention of going, but you had to because you were all, called all in? the time, all really? the time. Yeah, that was that was really <laughs> uh, getting called into a wave that everyone knew that you had no chance of making, and <laughs> they knew it and you knew it. But the beating or the wipeout was never as bad as what you would get if you didn't go. Uh-huh. So, and and the guys that were the the most brutal in my memory are, you know, the Willie Morris, the Todd Chesser, the Brock Littles, um, you know, to them, it was a game of, you know, how bad can you make, can you put the other guy to go over the falls? Uh, because it was, it was, uh, it was really part of what they enjoyed the most, I think was making sure that the other guy went over the falls at least once. Yeah. 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 Is it like that today? It, it is, it is, but I, I think the the characters uh, were more distinct at the time, and they they had, you know, certainly reputations of 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 doing uh, stuff like that. So, uh, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed surfing with with you know guys like Todd Chesser and Brock Little and Willie Morris um, because you know total unpredictability and you know, you're going to end up laughing at some part of the day and you're also going to take, you know, a, a, a good beating at some point during the day too. So with your son and you guys go to Hawaii, is he, what's the right term? Is, is he experienced what you experienced or is it completely different for him? He's gotten to experience a, lo- a lot of what I did just okay. from the fact that a lot of the guys that I've mentioned, you know, uh, some of them, at least, we, we still get a chance to surf with. Yeah, uh, and they're still that way. Uh, and they're st- they're treating him like they treated you, basically. Exactly, and they'll <laughs> always be the, the the way they are now. Uh, but cool. there's also, you know, a lot of a lot of knowledge. I mean, when you get the chance to meet uh, surfers at V Land mm-hmm. Sunset Pipeline, uh, you immediately start to absorb some of the knowledge that that these guys have spent decades in getting um so there's a benefit there's definitely a benefit there you know in in my earliest years no one was really sharing any knowledge uh it Mm. was it was it was you know kept under the vest more guarded uh and and kept you had to uh, learn it yourself you had to learn it yourself absolutely right you had to learn it yourself you had to learn the lineup at sunset no one was going to tell you about the saddle and and which way to paddle uh, you know, go the way that, you know, go this way, not that way. So West Jr. talks about going out at YMA, like I think 17, mm-hmm. and going out with you out there. Were yeah. you watching him or were you like kind of gave him the heads up of where, like the lineup and then no, he's on I was, his own? No, I was out there with him. Uh, yeah. You know, that's the, the fun thing about having a son that's in his 20s is, you know, you get to you get to surf a lot of waves you, you might not have normally surfed. Uh, okay. So yeah, we we spend a lot of time surfing together, ride a lot of waves together. But mm-hmm. uh, it, it's definitely a, a fun, super fun for me, and I, I yeah. know it's it's fun for him too. But yeah, yeah, I, I was I was out that day, and um, you know, it's funny because YMA is extremely intimidating, but it can be it can be a really easy way. Sometimes you you can get a lot of easy waves there, and mm-hmm. uh you can quickly find out that, Hey, this is, it's intimidating, but I can do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, then of course the one comes and, you know, changes everything. Uh, (laughs) and that's good too. That's also a learning experience. So, you know, I, and I think, I think both Wes Jr. And I have both learned, uh, 
the hard way um, about YMA in terms of, you know, going left. He mm. went left and, and took a really bad one uh, two years ago. Wow. And then this past January, I went left and, and took, a, took a horrific beating. But, uh, you know, years ago, really nobody ever thought about going left. The only guys that ever went left were Marvin Foster. Uh, but now, you know, Mark Healy and some others have kind of opened the door and shown that, hey, that, that, that section of the wave can be really good. And you see guys doing it a lot now. And then speaking of Marvin Foster and, and talking about the guys like Todd Chester and all these guys that you were surfing with, they were calling you to waves. Well, the Marvin Foster and like the Johnny Boy Gomes guys, how how is that in the lineup? Were they friendly with you or were they yeah, kind of the, the regulators? They they were. I mean, Johnny Boy was, I mean, for all of his reputation, uh, he's one of the coolest guys and yeah. one of the most inspirational surfers. And just his energy and his vibe was something that, man, it was like there was no other person like Johnny Boy. There was mm-hmm. no other Johnny Boy. There was one. And Marvin, same thing. Marvin had a very, very humble, very quiet intensity, uh, kind of the opposite of Johnny Boy, but but still okay. the same type of result. Um, Marvin was super cool. I remember the first year. He came to the East Coast to do a promo tour for Quicksilver. Mm. He stayed at my house. It was in the summer. It was in July. It's super hot, super humid. And I get up early. I walk out the front door, and I look, and something catches my eye. And I look in the corner of the deck, and there's Marvin Foster. He's laying on the wooden deck, uh, (laughs) bundled up in a sheet and a pillow. And I'm like, Marvin, what are you doing? (laughs) And he's like, Fuck, bra! It's cold. Mar- <laughs> Marvin had never spent the night in air conditioning in the house, so it was too it was too cold. He couldn't sleep. It was freezing, so he grabbed his sheet and a pillow, and he went out and slept on the wooden deck because you know funny. he'd never spent the night in that cold of an air conditioning uh, type setup before. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Who are some of the guys that you, when you surfed you competed against that you still in contact with? Is there anybody? Oh, wow. Let's see. Well, Michael Ho, for sure. Um, okay. See Michael every year. Uh, okay. You know, Buzzy Kerbox, still see, see Sean every now and then, Rabbit occasionally. Uh, you know, a lot of the same guys. But, you know, unfortunately, as we get older, a lot of these guys that were such inspiration and, you know, super motivational to me, a lot of them have, have, have passed on. So it's yeah. It's kind of tough as you we get older, you know, these guys mm-hmm. that to me they're still superhuman. Yeah. Uh, you know, they've they've passed away, so that's that's tough. But you mentioned Michael Ho. I mean, I, my opinion almost, I see some of his new newer videos, dude, he's surfing better than ever. Really? Uh, Michael is <laughs> Michael is, you know, charging he, he's, he's Michael. And yeah. it could be VLAN backdoor sunset Waimea you name it. I mean, uh, you know, and, and here's another guy, you know, I mentioned Michael, but James Jones, I mean, James Jones, we see him everywhere. V land back door, And he just quietly is out for hours and hours all day, you know, wearing a full suit, an old full suit, riding mm-hmm. a board that he shaped no leash. Uh, and it's the same James Jones, that it was decades ago. Mm. And that's super cool. And again, I mean, he does it in his own style, very quiet, very understated, you know, doesn't talk a lot. He's just out there getting his waves quietly, almost under the radar. But, uh, but yeah, it's amazing watching James. How was in your career when you ended it, when you stopped going on tour, were you bummed or was it time for you to, to wrap? I, it up? I think it was time. I mean, uh, it got, you know, it, it is a grind. And at the same time, you know, you're thinking, okay, what am I going to do? Uh, what am I going to do for an occupation? What am I going to mm-hmm. do for work? Yeah. Uh, cause you know, professional surfing, competitive surfing is, is, is a fairly short window. So yeah, you know, you're always thinking about that. And, and so for me, that was always something that was, you know, right there kind of, 
you know, hanging over your head and you're thinking about, and you, you need to figure out a good, mm-hmm. a good plan. So did you do that before you quit tour or? So for me, yeah, I started, happen? I started as a sales rep for Quicksilver, uh, you know, as I was still competing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of transitioned into work as a sales rep and then, uh, eventually, you know, moving into working for coastal edge, which is, uh, you know, what I do now along with the, uh, West lane surf camps. So surf camps and, and, and coastal edge are, you know, really what I've transitioned to. And that's, that's something that just kind of naturally happened from competitive surfing and just being yeah. in the industry and, and knowing guys and, and at all the companies and, you know, being a part of the company that, that they started and, uh, helping their company grow. So it's, it's a great industry to be in. Um, still is a relatively small industry compared to others, but it's a really special one because it's a lot of, uh, a lot of history and a lot of characters and a lot of charismatic people that have, have built it. So I just thought of a question, you working in the surf industry still, um, and I think some of the newer, co- or let's say that some of the existing companies, I think they used to hire surfers within, but I think possibly now they're hiring outsiders that aren't necessarily know the surf culture or know s- the history of surfing. Yeah, we've seen, we've that? seen, we've seen a little bit of that. And, and honestly, I've started to see it go back the other direction. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. So, you know, companies have started to understand that uh, long-term growth and long-term goals uh, are, it's more sustainable with, with people that are endemic, uh, to the sport and the lifestyle. Uh, you can, it's, it's easy to grow a company. You can, you can grow a company, uh, and it's sometimes it's easy to grow a company quickly, but the sustainability and the long-term success is, is heavily based on your core and the people that you have at the center of your business. And so, you know, I've seen, I've noticed, especially lately, a lot of these uh, bigger and smaller companies have gone back to looking, almost looking within, and they've they've yeah. been very successful for that. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then do you ever, you've been surfing for so long and it's been such a part of your, like, it's been the center of your life, really, right? Your whole life, almost. A- absolutely. My whole life. I mean... uh it's funny, uh, you know, you think about when you started and, you know, the excitement and the fun and just the obsession that you have when you're, when you're just starting out and, you know, and that, that level can ebb and flow over the years and over the Mm -hmm. decades. But, you know, it, it, for me, it's, it's still there. It's, it's there and it's, uh, it's really cool. And I love seeing that in younger surfers you know, that, that, that Mm -hmm. gleam in their eye when they've gotten their first wave or they've, they've gotten their first barrel or, or did a, you know, an air reverse for the first time and pulled it off, you know, those little things that, that get that, that just super fun look in the face of satisfaction, uh, from surfing. Yeah. And then do some of the younger competitive surfers, including your son, well, your son, they ever come to you for advice? Like, especially being from the East coast, like you're probably yeah. the guy for the East coast, as far as I'm concerned. I, I, I do get that. I do get that. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's competitively, it's, it's a different world now. And mm-hmm. sometimes my philosophy and, and my, uh, you know, strategies are, are somewhat outdated. Uh, oh, you know, you've, yeah. you've got to be, uh, you've got to be a little bit more, uh, flexible now in terms of, uh, heat strategy. Um, you can't stay locked in on, on the, the, the things that used to work because, you know, competitively criteria change. I mean, judging mm-hmm. criteria are constantly changing. Sometimes they change radically, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, some of the old school formats, yeah, they'll, they'll always still apply. But, but, you know, you have to, you have to also stay in tune with where the sport's headed, what the criteria is, what the judges are favoring and, you know, and the judging itself. I mean, even from the WSL level 
on down to an ESA event, you've got these fluctuations and, you know, I'm not going to say favoritism, but judges and judging panels kind of move up and down in, in these small waves on how they determine a high score. And a lot of it is pick, pick a favorite competitor. You're saying, yeah, it, it can okay. be, or a fa- a favorite, maybe not so much a favorite competitor or a favored competitor, but a, a, a certain style, a certain, mm, okay. uh, uh, form of the way they do their maneuvers mm-hmm. and their technicality. Uh, so, and sometimes style completely evaporates from, mm-hmm. from how the, the score is related to the ride. Uh, so there are some fluctuations now that you see from event to event. Uh, some of it is, is good. I, I love some of it. And then some of it just pisses you off. Well, when let's say the peak of your career at that point, the, the judging was what, like four waves or something. So early on it was, uh, you know, best, best three, you know, best okay. three and really length of ride determined yeah, a lot of, of the score because number of maneuvers length of ride yeah. and three to the beach. Three to the beach uh, yeah. And as you know, ASP evolved their criteria in, in judging and in format, it started to become best two, you know, and became, okay, more technical, more risk taking, uh, completing a risky maneuver. So that transition was, was a really good thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, you know, you come through an era where power and style become a huge part of the criteria. And then all of a sudden that starts to disappear and it becomes Mm -hmm. very much technicality, uh, style thrown out the window just complete the most <laughs> risky technical maneuver that you can do and you're going to get the score. So right those, those ebbs and flows of, of how the scores are based. Uh, it's interesting. It's sometimes it's, it's good to watch. Sometimes it's frustrating. And do you think, where do you see yourself? Are you going to surf forever? Like, do you have plans to ever stop it? And do you ever burn out on it? No, I, I, I don't burn out. I, I mean, I've gotten to the point where you know physically it it's mm-hmm. you know you just can't do what you used to do you want to yeah. but your body doesn't allow it right. and you know you can work and paddle and train and swim and you know do all the things that you you have to do uh you know just to kind of get by but uh i mean the, the stoke is still there it's still super fun you know it's it's really the core of of what i'm about what i love the most. So, you know, that part of it keeps me going. Um, the other thing is, you know, the, the, on the technology side boards right now are amazing. I mean, uh, surfboard technology is, is incredible. Um, I've got a board, it's a channel islands, uh, neck beard three, it's epoxy, Mm -hmm. no stringer, uh, carbon, no stringer in the board. And it's essentially the, you know, within an inch or so what I was riding when I was on tour, but the volume obviously thicker, wider, flatter rocker, big concave, uh, you know, back then it was glass on fins. Now it's future fin boxes, but you know, on the technology side, I think it's great. Everyone is benefiting from the variety of boards, the variety of designs and technologies. And that's the one thing that, that really, not only does it get more people, having fun in the water, but it, it keeps, it keeps older surfers in the water. So that's really cool to me. And I love, I love watching that. Yeah. For the first time, like, like you said, the older guys are actually in the water now. I think back when I started surfing, there was no one over 30, 35 surfing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so now you, you got guys in their 60s, 70s that are regulars like, out every day still. Yeah. You, you, you do. And, what are you and, riding? So oh, sorry. The board I ride the most, I mean, the, the two boards I ride the most are uh, a 6.5 Neckbeard 3. Yep. And it's, like I said, it's an epoxy board, three fin. Um, but, you know, the other board I ride a lot, it's hanging over my head right now. It's an 11.2 11, mm. 11 quad, and it's shaped okay. by Jesse Fernandez. And it, it's, you know, I had never in my life gotten a four fin board that I liked, always hated them, couldn't ride them, struggled, 
would watch other guys, you know, rip and I couldn't get one I liked. And, you know, the ironic thing is the, the quad that is the best riding board for me is an 11, two gun. And it turns like a board that's two or three feet smaller. It just, it's wow. bizarre. So, you know, years ago, I used to think, you know, big wave guns, they'll never change. A good gun is a good gun. And they're, that's as far as they're going to go. But even on big wave surfboards, uh, shape technology is, is moving and it's, it's helping, uh, not only hacks like me, but helping guys that, that are at jaws and risking their lives, uh, you know, every time they paddle out. Yeah. So you, you basically just ride a shortboard. Yeah. Do you ever switch it up to longboard or like? Yeah, I, I ride, I'll ride everything and anything and everything from, you okay. know, a catch surf log, oh, a really? long board, okay. a skipper, you know, uh, I'll ride all kinds of boards, but you know, the, the, I would say that for me personally, the, the number of different boards I ride, it's pretty narrow. It's not, uh, you know, it's, I don't, I don't ride a whole lot of different shapes. It's either going to be, uh, you know, a board from catch surf or it's going to be my short board. Yes. Um, and what do you think about social media and surfing? And, and like back in the day, there was movies. Now it's just short little clips. And are you even on social media? Not really. No. I mean, uh, I've got an Instagram for our surf camp, but I really don't oh, okay. spend any time on social media. I do love watching, uh, you know, new clips, uh, new videos. Um, that's, I mean, that's, that's awesome that, that, they they come out so fast and so quickly that stuff that's literally happening right now you can yeah. you can check it out so that's yeah. awesome but you know i i don't uh, i don't spend a whole lot of time on social media at all so okay. i'm kind of the you know out there uh, avoiding it <laughs> just a couple more questions cuz i just came up with a new question i never even thought of yeah guys like you and Curran and let's say Ted Robinson i just interviewed him too um some of you guys that were around for the surfer magazine, the surfing magazines, and then some of the other, you know, the smaller breakouts or whatever, you guys are going to be engraved in our heads, in my head until I die. Right. <laughs> like I can, I can still picture seeing you in the magazines. Right. Right on. And, um, the new generation of surfers, because the clips are rolling so fast, they're in and out with the next person or the next yeah. surfer. And that's, they'll never have that engraved in their head. I don't think. Yeah, we we talk about that. We talk about that a lot. The kind of the vanishing, uh, the 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 death of the surf movie, the surf video, the surf yeah. magazine. Yeah. Uh, but I think in media, you know, we'll probably see a resurgence, just like with music and the the reinterest in vinyl albums. Mm. Uh, I think you'll see you know some changes in surf media. And the mm -hmm. way that media is presented, uh, not only in, in print publications, but, you know, in 16 millimeter. Uh, so in movie form, I think you'll see a little bit of a comeback, if not a major comeback. And, you know, th that's really cool because younger surfers today will get to experience, you know, what we did in, in terms of having those indelible memories of watching a surf movie, uh, seeing the, the newest issue of surfer or surfing magazine when it hits your mailbox, you mm -hmm. know, those are, those are memories just, you know, me just like you are, are they're stuck in my head yeah. and they always will be. Yeah. And you think that's going to come back eventually? I think so. I think, uh, yeah. I think we'll see some, some of that come back. At least I hope so. <laughs> yeah, no, I would hope so too. I just, I mean, there's surfers journal, but besides that, there's nothing else really. I don't think. Yeah, Maybe I mean, uh, Free, free surf, surf Magazine out of Hawaii. Yeah, that's, Free. Uh, yep. You know, that's a special publication. That's you know, we get that over here on the East Coast, and that's a right. big deal to to me. Yeah, for sure. But it's only a big deal to a very small, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the overall surf world. It's it's a just a small sliver of of surf media. Did anybody ever walk up to you and be like, I remember you from? 20 years ago, 30 yeah, years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I get that a lot. And, uh, you know, the cool thing is, you know, we get, uh, I get a lot of comments specifically from the performers, which was, you know, the first real VHS surf movie yeah. when 
surf transition from 16 millimeter and super eight film into a VHS video. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we didn't, we didn't know it at the time. It just, it, to us, it was a surf movie and yeah, it's on a plastic VHS cassette, but the fact that that ushered in, you know, kind of the video revolution and, and what surf movies transitioned to was that VHS format. So yeah, I, I do get a lot of that because that was a, you know, pretty popular movie and, and kind of a iconic, uh, video for that era. Okay. So I think I'm about to wrap this up, but then I come up with another question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, okay, man. One more question. I do this all night. I'll just grab a cold beer. <laughs> grab. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I'm really going to wrap this up. Okay. But all your photos in the mag, which you were in a lot. I mean, you pretty much every mag you opened up in the eighties, you were there, right? Did you work with those photographers? Was it like, I'm, you guys are calling each other up like the swell. Let's go here and hit this place. Lights good. You know here. that that's a good question. I I did not until probably late in the first year of me traveling on tour. You know, traveling with Willie Morris. Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, he, him I, too. I went from from being I didn't know any of the photographers. Yeah, and didn't hang with them. Didn't shoot with them. I went from one extreme to the other. Uh, Willie, Willie was like, he was the man. He was, he was one of the most professional professionals because he had 100%. every photographer on his uh, phone list. He worked with all of them. <laughs> he had no preferences whether you worked for Surfing Magazine or Surfer. But Willie, was, mm-hmm. Willie Morris was a guy that he was the most um, – professional and most effective at understanding how the photographers can make or break your career. So just, yeah. just by the fact that I traveled with him and hung with him, uh, you know, I got photos that I never would have gotten ever. Yeah. That's fascinating. I mean, it made you, I mean, yes, you're a great surfer. You are a great surfer. I could, I mean, I've seen video, everything else. But really, you're you're, you're a, the, one of the most photographered guys. And then Willie Morris with you know his designs on his board. That was you knew it was Willie Morris. Yeah, absolutely. The most distinctive airbrushes. Yeah. Uh, big big logos. Yeah. Strategically placed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was there was uh, no one quite up to his level in terms of understanding, you know, the importance of the magazine photographer and how to work with magazine photographers. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, um, Wes, you have any final words? No, man, we covered a lot. I'm, I'm stoked. Uh, I'm really stoked. You (laughs) you put this thing together and, uh, I'm stoked. We did it. I'm stoked. I'm so, I'm so stoked to meet you. Like even Peter, I really appreciate you taking your time. Yeah, man. uh, Absolutely. Anyhow, everybody, this is, uh, Mike and, uh, Wes Lane Sr. And uh, we're out of here. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Please follow us on Instagram and follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Give us five stars if you listen to us on Apple. And do me a favor and tell a friend that Quivercast is back. I'd like to thank Blue Factory and Dave Hegstrom for the music. And I'll see you all in the lineup.
Hey, you guys. Endless Summer box set. This thing is legit. It's authentic. Numbered certificate in it. It has a five-frame film strip. From the original print, you will literally own a piece of history. It has a specially minted bronze medallion. Dude, that thing's sick. Okay, there's so much more here. Go to the show notes. There's a link on there. Go check this piece of history out. This thing's rad. Seriously. Smithsonian American History Museum has it. It took four years of research with 3.5 in production. All hand assembled. This thing's rad. So much to this awesome box set. Remastered DVD. Sharper images than the original film. But dude, this thing's so sick. Link in the show notes.